This is probably the strangest motherboard I've tested. Today we're taking a look at the BA50i ARS Pro from Gigabyte. This is their lower tier AM5 Mini iTex motherboard just below the X870i IS model. This is going to be an overview and not a full review as I don't have another competitor motherboard to fully test it against. The BA50i ARS Pro's design is relatively laid back. There's still a gamery look to it, but much more subtle. I'm a big fan of motherboards with the least amount of eagles and dragons. The VRM heatsink has this glossy black plastic shroud with a reflective ARS logo, continuing the design down to the M.2 heatsink. This isn't the worst Defender and I have no problem using this in a minimal build. For the power phase, we have an A plus 2 plus 1 design, so not ideal for any hardcore overclocking, but this board is aimed at the mid-tier enthusiast. Plus, undervolting is a much more common practice when building mini ITX. In the center of the board, we have the very vulnerable AM5 socket. The position of the socket actually really does matter. This could affect the CPU cooler and case compatibility. Dual channel DDR5 DIMM slots that can be overclocked to 8400 mega transfers. We encountered one of the board's new Easy system for the PCIe 5.0 M.2 slot. This mechanism coined the Easy Latch Click. Like the others, are our toolless features and in theory should make building and swapping out parts more seamless. However, this is where I encountered the first flaw. You have to squeeze your fingers into the small area to unlatch the heatsink. Once properly installed, it does offer adequate cooling to your SSD. Directly below, there's a single PCIe 5.0 by 16 slot, which happens to be reinforced, which their marketing team calls the ultra durable PCIe armor. Here in the lower right corner of the motherboard, we're met with the second Easy system, the Easy Latch Plus Pro Max Ultra, or just Easy Latch Plus for short. Through a button and pulley system, this allows you to unseat your GPU or Ryzen cable much easier without going to third base with your motherboard. I only encountered one issue with this when installing the Ryzen lock bar in the Form T1 case. Because the Easy Latch system occupies the lower right motherboard standoff, I had to remove the system to install the riser bar. Just something to keep in mind if you fall into this very niche group. For board connectivity, you have your 8-pin CPU connector. Next to it is one of three fan headers. This one is a normal size one for the CPU fan, one RGB LED header, two RGB Gen 2 addressable headers, two smaller fan headers for additional fans. These connectors require an additional adapter that introduces a new point of failure. You get your standard 24-pin motherboard connector. You have a USB 3.2 header for case connectivity. These tiny pins are the case intrusion and reset headers. Then there's two SATA ports if you need to connect your 2.5 or 3.5 inch storage device. The front panel connector headers alongside the USB 2.0 header. Clear CMOS pins for resetting your BIOS. And if your case supports it, you have a USB-C header placed lower on the board, making it a bit easier to reach in compact cases. And we have a front panel audio header floating on the VRM shroud. Like the fan headers, another space saving feature. I'll leave it up to you to decide if it's a net positive or negative feature. Now let's talk rear connectivity. We get two USB type A 2.0 ports, one designated to utilize the QFlash functionality, one HDMI port. I'm going to assume it's HDMI 2.0 or 2.1, the manual doesn't clarify. A dedicated QFlash button for flashing your BIOS, a helpful feature when upgrading to a newer supported CPU. More USB Type-A ports. These are USB 3.2 Gen 1 ports, by the way. You also get one USB Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 port, two auxiliary audio jacks, two additional USB Type-A 3.2 Gen 2 ports here in red, a RJ45 2.5 gigabit LAN port. Lastly, we have the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antenna, an easy style connector, which in my opinion is handy versus the old turnstile connector. Nearly half of the back of the motherboard looks empty, especially when you compare it to the same tier board from ASUS. But you're not actually missing many things, but some quality of life features like a reset CMOS button, a audio interface connector, and a line-in audio jack. On the back, we have the standard AM5 backplate and the second M.2 slot. This one is PCIe 4.0. In the box, you get those two fan adapters for the fan and pump header on the top, the Wi-Fi 7 antenna, we get a screw for the rear M.2 SSD along with a few extra thermal pads. I am actually a fan of the BIOS UI. It didn't take me long to find basic settings like PPO, Expo, and the PCIe device settings. In my SSD test, we're looking at the cooling effectiveness of the active PCIe 5.0 heatsink. We're using the Oracle IG740 Pro PCIe 4.0 2TB drive with advertised write speeds of 7400 megabytes per second. In my humble opinion, it's better to lock the SSD fan speed to 50% or below for best performance to noise ratio. 
I ran Cinebench R24 multi-core on both the B850i and the Asus X670EI using the Ryzen 9800X3D. And just to be clear, these are not comparative boards, but I just wanted to show you something. On the BA50i, we see 71 degrees on the chipset temperature, 62 degrees on the VRM temperature, while pulling 118 watts, yielding a multi-core score of 1,238. On the Asus X670EI, we see 62 degrees on the chipset, a 9 degree advantage over the BA50i. VRM temperatures are improved by 8 degrees, while the CPU pulls 132 watts, ending with a score of 1,323, about 85 points higher. Gigbyte made some interesting decisions on this board. Some paid off and others fell short. The reinforced PCIe by 16 slot looks good and sturdy. The design is gamery but really subtle. For the most part, the Easy Connect systems are competent. A personal favorite of mine is the quick connect and disconnect of the wireless antenna. The BIOS looks really clean. You can access many options without entering the advanced mode. What I didn't like is a smaller PWM fan header. What happens when one of these adapters fail and you can't find another replacement? I think the easy system for the M.2 heatsink could use some work. It barely clicks into place and held on by one or two millimeters. The lack of a second USB Type-C port on the rear is a real bummer. I like to see at least two, even if it's a lower class USB. For $250 to $260, it's extremely competitive price-wise, but that does come with some sacrifices. Whether you should buy this depends on how you value $30, as the ASUS BA50i offers a much better I.O. offering, which includes a second USB-C port and a dedicated clear CMOS button. What do you think? Leave your comment down below, and as always, if you like what you see here, feel free to like and subscribe, and see you next time.